Hey everybody, and welcome back to part five of Let's Write an Adventure, uh, where we are creating an adventure for D&D &D in real time here on YouTube. Uh, as I walk you through my entire process, uh, sort of soup to nuts, if you will, um, explaining my thought process as I go through this whole bit. So um, if you are new joining us, uh, we have so far talked about how to brainstorm ideas for an adventure, came up with the idea that we're writing one where the characters are hired by uh, some community leader uh, to recover the only known deposit of our MacGuffin, something called cold iron, this uh, material that is uh, very powerful against Fae uh, that's been lost in a glacial mine once ravaged by disease. Uh, the community needs it to save themselves from the foretold coming of a uh, group of hags uh, that we've named the Blood Good Sisters. Uh, and they've and the character's been led to believe the village plans to fight these hags. Um, and uh, they need the, uh, the cold iron to do that. Uh, but when the characters return with it, they'll discover the village actually intends to use the cold iron to pay off the hags, uh, and thus completing their ancient pact. And the party has to make a decision whether or not to support empowering this coven with obvious evil intentions, uh, or to uh, convince the community to fight back, uh, knowing that there are gonna be consequences for everybody involved. And so that's our framework here. And we spent a little time uh, building out our villains, since this is largely a villain-driven adventure. Uh, they're the ones who are kind of setting the tune, if you will. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we have also now dove into uh, writing the actual plot for our adventure. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get back into that. So screen share here. So. Um, we're using that Notion template that you can find in the link to this video uh, for anybody who's interested in using this to build their own adventures. Um, and last time we were uh, piecing together the glacial mine. So let's go ahead and open that back up. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the uh, some of the features of this place. Um, very loose, we're kind of hopping around as we come up with ideas and uh, uh, and you know, and these things occur to us, and that's okay. That's all part of this process, right? You you write with, you go with what you know, and you build on that. And the more specific you get with the things that you know, the more specifics you'll know about other elements of your story and the characters, um, and that'll all kind of bleed out into the ultimate web of an adventure. Um, and so we talked about okay, so the our glacial mine, we decided. Uh, if you'll recall, is not actually in the far north in some frozen tundra, but it's actually smack dab in the middle of some hot wasteland, um, a desert or, or the like. Um, and it exists because it sits atop a font of magic that allows this glacier, uh, this monolithic glacier, to exist here in this environment. Um, one, because that's cool, and sometimes it's fun to throw cool things into a D&D &D game. Um, but two, um, it gives a little more context, a little more flavor to this, other than it's just one other chunk of ice in a sea of big chunks of ice. All right, so uh, we sort of stream of consciousness went through and filled out some, uh, some potential key locations uh, as part of this glacial mine, figuring that it needed to have a fortress element to it and then the mine below it, since it's sort of out in the middle of nowhere and the only known repository of this, uh, uh, this powerful material that would be coveted in, um, by many factions. Um, and so we started just kind of uh, jotting down room ideas, knowing that we're gonna keep some of these, we're gonna cut some of these, we may add some more later, but we're gonna take a stab at filling these out. Um, and then later on, uh, you know, after we've got a good feel for this place, we'll sit down and we'll sketch out a map and let that inform our revisions to this. Um, so in reviewing this, um, there's a bunch of other sort of little places here that we could jot down ideas. But when I start working through a dungeon location like this, um, specifically, I will often try to come up with themes of creatures that might inhabit this sort of place. Um, sometimes that's easy when it's already, you know, inhabited. If it was a stronghold that was still held by the original creators, we'd know that they're elves, and we could use um, elf and eladrin uh, sort of themed elements there. 
Um, but in a place that's abandoned like this, that's um, suffused with disease, so we know that was part of our original idea that the plague drove the original inhabitants out. Um, we can use that to sort of inform what kinds of creatures might live here. They would need to be things that are comfortable moving through filth and decay uh, and contamination. Um, so we could think of you know, creatures that uh, carry disease themselves or um, are immune to disease or are, um, we might even stretch that a little bit and, and talk about creatures that are poisonous or immune to poison. Um, you know, you will, as you build these sort of, you know, find that you have your kind of go-to creatures. Um, I frequently go to undead when I work on this sort of stuff. And it's because I really think that undead are, are a very versatile subset of creatures um, for multiple reasons, you know. First of all, uh, you can give them very human emotions, um, you know, with ghosts and revenants and that kind of thing that have motivations that keep them linked to this world. Um, same thing with, you know, vampires um, and witches and, and all that kind of stuff that, um, that have very human motivations, motivations that your characters, or, or rather, more importantly, your players, will resonate with, will, will understand, um, even if they don't share those same motivations. Um, and, uh, but also, you can create uh, creatures that are entirely evil, that, that there's no moral quandary for your players or your characters as to what they do about these, uh, you know, do in these encounters. You know, if you stumble upon a goblin camp, do you slay the goblins? Do you negotiate with the goblins? Does it change your decision if there's, you know, goblin warriors protecting goblin families? Um, you know, there is a, there sometimes is an element of morality in those moments that, while very interesting from a storytelling component, could be not what you intended when you're designing these. Whereas very rarely um, I find you players stumble into a group of zombies and go, you know what, we should, we should try to get to know these zombies. We should try to find out why they're here. No, they, they hack and they slash and they fight because undead uh, are to our, you know, our, our, our very mundane minds um, abominations, evil uh, inherently or unnatural at the very least. So I think they're very useful to use um, and I like them for this. You know, if this was a different environment, um, you know, if this was a more active mine and it had less of an abandoned, um, you know, dead feel to it, you know, we might try to look for something else, something um, like cobalts uh, in here. I mean, I love cobalts. I know they're low level and you can just waltz through them in a lot of ways, but I just, the trickery of cobalts, I, I think is so much fun to play with, but I digress. Um, and so, you know, I think I'm going to start with sort of a, an undead theme, if you will, in this, um, to give it sort of a sense of cohesion as the, uh, as the adventurers move through this part of the adventure. Um, we'll make sure to use things that aren't undead in other parts of the adventure. We may even sprinkle some of that in here as well as we work through. But I like to start with the theme because it makes the place seem linked. When you just sort of drop all kinds of creatures into a dungeon that don't have some connection to one another, it can feel very patchwork, like it's a series of almost randomly generated rooms, even if it might be realistic to have, you know, uh, you know, uh, rust monsters alongside, uh, you know, ogres and alongside a, uh, you know, a fire snake uh, in your in your dungeon, because those are things that you know live in the wild and would have penetrated into this uh, into this place. Um, that may be realistic and they may seem natural, but it, but thematically, from a storytelling standpoint, it feels ad hoc and less connected. So I like to start with a theme as a place from which to digress. Um, so let's let's go with that. We've already got some undead in here, which I like. We've got the idea uh, in this cold storage room, this cold iron storage room. So I'm going to call it cold storage more than once as we move through this. Uh, in this cold iron storage room. 
Well, this is where our repository of the, the cold iron is. This is our MacGuffin. Um, and so we've said that the door's locked with three keys. The locks are magically warded against picking. Um, we should also, well, we probably don't have to worry about knock with this. Um, and I say worry about knock um, because we got these, you know, these three locks that we need to open up. And, uh, uh, and if we use knock, you know, even magically warded with something like arcane lock or what have you, uh, knock would cancel it out for an hour. But a third level character isn't going to have three knock spells that they can access. So unless you have a party who is uh, multiple people have taken the spell knock, you know, I, there's still, there's not much of a threat of the, of the characters not having to go look for these keys, um, which is the really the point. Um, which raises an interesting question as we kind of move through this. Your characters are going to have special abilities, as all characters do, that allow them to make um, easy work of some challenges. Generally speaking, that's okay. You don't want to nerf those abilities. You don't want to look consistently for routes to kind of slap down that advantage because your players feel really good when they can be like, oh, but I can do this thing, and I breeze past this. That's a cool moment for them and a cool moment for their character. The only time where I really advocate thinking about how to mitigate some of those abilities is when breezing through a particular element would make the entire adventure or a large chunk of the adventure um, uninteresting. So for example, if our characters can just waltz in here, walk up to this cold iron storage door and go, all right, knock, 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 uh, and all three locks open up and the door springs open, they grab the cold iron and they waltz out. Well, that's not very entertaining. That's not very satisfying for the players. They just kind of showed up, got what they needed and left. So, so we'll make a point here in the cold iron section to, to think about ways that characters of third level might be able to circumvent three locks and take uh, actions to disable that. So first thing that comes to my mind on here, so just in case we end up with a party where people have gotten a little crafty um, or they game this, we are gonna say, we can see something along the lines of um, door uh, encased in anti-magic field. Uh, and then we'll say radius and just to make sure I'll come over here and I'll look up what the range is on knock because don't know it off the top of my head um, and filter spells filter spells filter spells all right uh, so it's a 60 foot range Okay, so, all right, ba -ba 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 -bum. and let's see, emergency range, let's, tr let's also say anti-magic, because uh, I'm pretty sure there's a commensurate spell. If there's not, we'll go check the Beholder stat block. Yeah, Anti-Magic Field, here we go. Let's read the description here to see if we need to extend that aura of Anti-Magic the door out 60 feet. Um, do, 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 do. This area is divorced from magical energy. Uh, when the spells can't be cast, some creatures disappear. Even magic items become mundane until the spell is ending, okay. Uh, spells been just those created by artifact or data are suppressed in sphere and can't protrude into it. Perfect. So we don't need to do that. So we can say, we can come over to here and say, cased by a, cased an anti magic field. That is the spell, right? Yeah, cool. Um, and in fact, just so that I can make this easier to play later, I will get the link. Come over here. I'm a little bit OCD about this. I 
would like to use the same kind of nomenclature that exists in um, published D&D adventures where spells are in italics, creatures are in bold, if I can. Um, and so we'll put that in italics. We'll put the link there, and we'll say radius. We said it was a 10 yeah, 10 foot radius. Cool. And then we'll see radius 10 feet. Yahtzee. All right. Um, cool. So that will defend against. Um, yeah, that'll say that'll defend against magical opening of this. Um, it kind of nerfs the whole idea of it being magically warded against the picking. We'll come to that. We can always set the DC is super high on that. So we really need the keys. Um, cool. Uh, so let's say not magically warded against picking. We'll say blocks are warded against picking. And we'll set the DC at like, I don't know. We'll say it's like 25. Um, again, point is we want the players to have to go get these three keys. Um, okay, cool. So we've got that in here. Uh, we've got a fun encounter in the mines, the mine tunnels here where they're kind of being hunted. Um, so we've got these three keys to litter around. Um, where the idea is in our mine tunnel, you know, there's a regular network of intersecting passages, um, you know, pretty unlit. There's patches of, of the infectious gas in here. There's places that have collapsed. Uh, and then there's three ghouls um, that are uh, that are hunting the characters uh, through the tunnels. So uh, to encourage characters to spend time in here um, and thus have to risk being hunted by these ghouls, these incursions and encounters with the ghouls, um, we can say uh, treasure... One of cold iron storage keys are uh, is found here. Okay, uh, so yeah, we can put one of the keys in here, um, encouraging the characters to hunt around this place while they uh, while they deal with these ghouls. Um, so that's a that's a decent one there, um, you know. In a facility, in a place like this, we don't want every room to be an encounter. Um, combat encounters, um, when you do them too many times back to back to back, they can get they can make it feel like a little bit of a slog. You need to give your uh, give your players room to breathe, and those periods of of nothingness in the game where they come into a room and there's nothing particularly exciting in there. Um, while they while they feel when you're writing this, like, oh, it's going to be a dead spot, it's not. It's a moment of tension relief, which is really, really important when we're doing this because if the players have just come from being hunted by ghouls, right, where the tension's been really high and now they have the win of this key, if they jump right back into another fight, it doesn't feel like, ah, things have gotten even more intense. It, thing, it feels like, oh, crap, we got another fight to do. Whereas if you give them a couple, you know, a room or two, a few, to just kind of breathe and, and get back to, okay, we've got this, we're, we're on the right path, and then they stumble into the next um, stumbling block, the next encounter, well, now... They've had a moment to recover from that tension, and they're going to feel that rise in tension again. So it actually makes the game um, more effective. It makes the storytelling more effective as you play when we put some empty spaces in here. So we don't need a lot of encounters. Um, in fact, uh, we might even just kind of stick to three key encounters, and maybe sprinkle in one or two or you know a few others um, that are... Uh, uh, they might be interesting. And I just realized this is key encounters because these will be encounters where they find the keys. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see here. Where might these sorts of keys end up? Um, 
want to go with reasonable places, but not necessarily obvious places, um, because you don't want... You want players to be rewarded with good logic, but you don't want it to be like, well, duh, of course there's a key there. Um, so, maybe we put a key in a garrison instead of like the noble chambers or in the throne room. Hmm. Yeah, because we could say that the, the mine tunnel key was the foreman's key, and they dropped it there, so it wouldn't be in their place. Um, so maybe maybe the three keys are in the mine tunnels, the garrison, and uh, perhaps they're in the, uh, the forge room. Um, yeah, so the foreman would have had one. It gets dropped in the mines during the escape. Makes sense. Um, your security forces, if you will, would have had one uh, in the garrison, and then your your crafters would have had one. Um, you know, those might be the three entities that need to hold on to the keys um, uh, to have access to this cold iron. Um, you know, things like, you know, having one of the, the leaders of this group, the royalty, the king, or your lords, or what have you, um, hold on to these keys is I think a little too on the nose. I think it feels a little too obvious in this and perhaps not practical in reality, right? Like, so if they're, this is an active mine and they occasionally need to get into cold storage and they do that, you need the three, th the three key holders to drop what they're doing, go over and open this up. It's hard to, you know, go up to your, your queen and go, excuse me, queen, if you would please take a break from running our entire, uh, you know, our entire kingdom. Uh, to just come down the stairs and open up the pantry door for me. Um, that would be great. You know, that's it. It That cold iron's powerful, but I don't think it's that like, you know, WMD level um, where it really needs the approval of the sovereign to access it, the raw material that is. So, yeah, so keeping it out, keeping it out of some place like the throne room of the nobles chambers, I think will add a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a curveball for your players, but still they'll be able to logic their way through this. So let's make some notes here. So let's say garrison. Um, uh, let's keep my notes similar here. Treasure one uh, cold iron storage key here. And we'll save time by using good old copy and paste. Uh, ba -ba -ba, I'm gonna forge. I keep wanting it to be down like below here, but it's not. That's okay. And paste. Cool. So that tells you that we need encounters in the garrison room and in the forge room. And bear in mind that if we decide later that, you know, eh, these aren't perfect places for this, well, we can we can change it. Um, but already kind of conceptualizing the map in my brain and how we might segment this out, it would be unlikely that the forge would be right next to the mine tunnels, nor would it be right next to the garrison, and the garrison's not gonna be right next to the mine tunnels either. And so it is likely that these are three points that we spread throughout our, our dungeon, our, throughout our facility here, um, which is good. And the thing we want to avoid is just like, you know, players can go to the first three rooms they find and find exactly what they need and then leave. Um, again, that's very, that's, that's unsatisfying um, in, a, uh, in, in an adventure like this. So, let's see. Um, garrison full of soldiers, right? You know, so this would be... We'd probably, I mean, skeletons come to mind here. Maybe zombies in there. We can think about that. Um, you know, the uh, uh, the forge. Um, we could have ghosts in there. These encounters don't all need to be combat encounters is the other thing, right? You know, 
yes, they can all go to combat, and and you should plan that they might. You should have that that set up in your brain that they might go to to a place of combat. Um, but you can guide it towards other solutions. Ghosts are fun for that, I think. So let's start with the forge here. Um, let's say that it's haunted by the ghost of the forge master, and maybe we give him a cooler name later, but we'll start with that. Um, uh, we can see something like he's still bent uh, to her final task. Um, or I should say still bent over her unfinished masterpiece. Because mm. that would be kind of interesting, right? Like, so disease, this plague rolls through this, um, through this, uh, through this, 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 this glacial fortress mine, whatever it is at this point, is going to need like a real name at some point soon because it's becoming a mouthful. Um, you know, you can see everybody's sort of, you know, panicking, they're grabbing the things that are most important, and they're trying to get out of there, and you have this, um, this obsessive craftswoman who is, um, who's been spending, I don't know, years of her life working on this one thing, uh, and it's not yet finished, at least not yet finished to her, um, to her standard, um, and so she's racing against time, trying to get it finished before she goes so that she can take it with her, um, and, and ultimately uh, does not succeed, um, which does a couple of things for us here. One, it can give us a cool piece of treasure other than just the key to drop in here, which is something we want to keep in mind. You know, the characters are going to want more than just the three keys that they'll use here and then leave behind in the MacGuffin. They're going to want some kind of uh, reward for their efforts. So we might have an item like that in here. Um, and it also gives go. It also gives us a ghost with a purpose, an objective, um, who perhaps won't let them take the key from this room um, unless she can be dismissed. You know, she's protective over this workstation, her forge. Um, she doesn't want things going. She doesn't want things being taken away. The key included, even though it's meaningless to her at this point. It shouldn't be taken from her, uh, in her opinion. And so maybe the characters need to help her finish her masterpiece. Maybe that's maybe that's the trick to this room, that they help her finish her masterpiece. And then she is, you know, released from her earthly bonds, uh, and now they're free to recover the key. Um, okay, I kind of like that idea. Again, because they can roll up and just fight her if they want, um, but they can also put a little more effort into this, get um, uh, get a magical item out of it, get the boon of that, and then uh, also they have something that's, that's more of a social encounter, um, perhaps even a little bit of a skill challenge uh, to solve this. Um, I like little points like this throughout adventures where there's kind of two routes that a character could take, or even even three. Um, and one of them is an obvious route that they can still win and get the thing that they need. Um, and uh, in some cases might be more straightforward or, or, uh, or might be easier, ultimately. Or they can choose a more difficult path, like a little more nuanced, um, and potentially not just get the thing they need, but get something else uh, with that. It helps make character choices really matter. Um, and that's so important to avoid that idea of railroading characters because really railroading characters has nothing to do with um, having a concrete plot that the story follows. That's just good story structure. Railroading characters is when the decisions that they make at those various plot points um, don't have any influence on, uh, on the characters themselves and on how prepared they are to meet the next challenge. Um, when you remove, when you remove any consequence of character choices, 
that's when railroading occurs. So where we can add these little, these little moments of decision throughout are really, really helpful. Okay, so let's type that out here real quick. Just make a couple notes to ourselves. Um, uh, the ghost of the forge master is uh, bound to the material plane so long as the as her final masterpiece remains unfinished. Um, she will not um, allow any item to be removed from this room while she remains on the material plane. She attacks only to defend herself or to prevent the removal of any object such as the key. Cool. And again, when you write these, you don't necessarily need to write full sentences for yourself. Um, it helps me when I run this um, personally, but you make whatever notes you need to to just jog your own memory. Remember, these adventures are for you to run, and so whatever notation works for you is the one you should use. Um, so let's say uh, the solution to this then is characters um, can release her from the material plane by helping to finish her masterpiece. And what is that masterpiece? Um, you know, the go-to for this kind of thing is like, ooh, it's a sword, it's a shield, it's a coat of armor, suit of armor. Um, and those are all, you know, viable things. Um, when I'm writing this, when I'm writing an adventure for my, for my group, you know, for, for the, the players in my campaigns, when I look at what kind of magical items to put in there, I will try to pick things that I know that they're going to like um, or pick things that I think that they could have a lot of fun with. Um, uh, and I don't necessarily mean powerful items. Sometimes, like, sometimes just a, f a common magic item, like the Staff of Bird Calls or whatever, can be just really fun for somebody to role play with. Um, so you don't need to go, you know, absolutely wild and go, oh, well, you know, it's a Holy Avenger that's in here. That's, that's what she's working on. Um, nor does it need to be a weapon necessarily. Um, you know, uh, when I'm working, when I'm writing stuff that's for other people to play, um, you know, other DMs to run, other parties to, to adventure through, I will sometimes leave the treasure, the magical items a little open-ended. I'll say things like, you know, plus one ammunition, arrows or bolts. I'll say, you know, plus one weapon, uh, you know, player's choice. You know, that way, so, you know, because there's never, at least I think that it's really frustrating when you're, you know, an axe-wielding barbarian and you are the only, uh, you know, you're the real tank of your group, you're the, the, the big melee guy, or, or maybe you're the, one that, the only one that doesn't have any magic weapons yet, and uh, you roll up and you guys find a plus one longsword, and you're like, well, but I only use great weapons. You know, it, it, it sort of takes the shine off of fighting that magic item, um, especially when you know, whatever the weapon is doesn't really matter. Um, just that it's magic and plus one is what's really important to um, the balancing of the adventure. Um, so let's take a moment here and kind of think about what sort of thing might be interesting uh, at this level. Um, for that, I will reflect, often I will go back to Xanathar's Guide and I will reflect on um, the awarding magic items information in here. 
um, because you can use the stuff in the in the Dungeon Master's Guide. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And in fact, we'll go to that very frequently. And indeed, when I write stuff for publication, I tend to limit myself to either magic items that I've created or the ones that are present in the Dungeon Master's Guide, just so there's, there's fewer source books that a potential DM needs to have access to um, to run that adventure. Less limiting when it's my own stuff. It's just for me. Um, but to kind of get an idea how beefy this should be, I will frequently come back to this, you know, a magic items awarded by tier chart here um, and look at the character level, you know, also uh, awarded by rarity to kind of get an idea for what I'm, what we're thinking about. Um, we're talking on an adventure that's balanced for level three. And so we wouldn't want to do anything, you know, anything beefier than a rare magic item, most likely. Um, and frankly, you know, even a, a common, you know, even an uncommon item uh, might be a lot. But a common item, while well, I tend to pepper those in a fair bit, um, you know, that doesn't have a good, oh, this is my masterpiece kind of feel to it, does it, right? Not for the Forge Master, you know. Um, so maybe an uncommon item. Now, that being said, if you're writing an adventure that has a higher um, uh, frequency of magic items, you know, they pop up more often in your narrative. Uh, and I just realized you probably can't see what I've got. But I've been scrolling through there with my face in the way. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you've got a higher frequency of magic items in your adventure, you can ignore this or beef it up or do whatever the do whatever the heck you want. Um, really, it's ultimately up to you. Um, but just to kind of an effort to kind of keep this somewhere in the in the, the realm of balanced, um, let's see what, what kind of um, uncommon magic items we might find. And again, we're kind of loose here. So let's, so I frequently will, will do is just come over to the, um, the game rules here. And there we go, magic items. Let's open up that new tab because... I'm obsessed with new tabs. Um, and we'll move the back to the other side. Uh, I feel like I'm jogging across the screen. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and hit ourselves up with some uncommon and filter that. Let's see what we come up with. Hmm. Oh, interesting. Adamantine armor is uncommon. You know, armor certainly has a feel of the masterpiece of the Forge Master has that vibe to it. Um, Alchemy Jug is something I give out a lot. I think it's fun, um, just narratively. I have, uh, you know, it's got a whole list of, of things that, uh, it's like a Swiss Army knife of, uh, of, of fluids that your characters can summon and use for various stuff. Uh, and I've seen them use things like the mayonnaise. Um, I also, you know, told them on the fly once they can make white claw in this. And uh, they have used that more often than any other uh, liquid that that thing produces. Um, so let's see. Uh, got a bunch of grungs and tomb annihilation grunk on white claw. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Yeah, plus one ammunition. Again, that isn't a very good, you know, forge master's masterpiece feel to it. All purpose tool. What? Need the tomb and find artificer. Um, yeah, unless I am writing this for a specific party and I know that they have a specific class in there, I try to steer away from uh, objects that have to be attuned by a specific class. Because again, that falls flat if you know a party comes across and they go, oh, we found this really cool magic item. Oh, we need an artificer to use it. We don't have an artificer in the group. Oh, we need a warlock to use it. We don't have a warlock in the group. Um, that doesn't, it feels, feels less fun. Um, boo, 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 boo. But that's cool. I'll have to keep that in the mind later. Or maybe just, or maybe, you know, if this is something we wanted to use, we can just remove the requires attunement by an artificer requirement on here. Um, that's a possibility. All purpose tool has a very master craft artisanal feel to it. Um, bum, 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 bum. Uh, kind of get through armor of weightlessness. What does that do for us? Five charges, we lose one more charge. Jump, levitate. Okay, that's kind of cool. 
that's a very elvish kind of masterwork potentially you know get through all these i love using tattoo magic in my campaigns i think it's a lot of fun um but it doesn't fit this um through and kind of work our way through this boomerang shield what is this range weapon attacking the shield uh, you can make a ranged weapon attack with this magic shield. Okay. Oh. Interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of options. And we could spend all day kind of working our way through these in various levels. I kind of like the idea of something magic. Um, well, I already kind of said that. Um, something, I like the idea of armor. I do like the idea of armor. It's something that a lot of players are going to be able to use. Um, but again, you know, it's a, it's a risk because you might get characters that can't wear heavy armor, medium armor, something along the lines of that. So, um, but I kind of like it for this. I kind of like it for this. What I, hmm, I don't want to make it, you know, adamantine, and mithril really isn't the point of this mine. This, this mine is a, um, is a cold, you know, it's a cold iron mine, right? Which has got um, anti fey properties to it. So maybe we craft something for this. Maybe we maybe make something unique. Um, and so let's see, let's see here. What is, uh, what is protection from, what's what, protection from good and evil? Let's see, that's a first level spell. That's reasonable. Um, did I protect against Fey? I think Fey are one of the, yeah, Fey are one of the things in here. Okay. Hmm. Okay, what does it do? So, protection grant, grant several benefits. Creatures of those types have disadvantage on attack rolls against the target. The target also can't be charmed, frightened, or possessed by them. Target is already charmed. Mm. Okay. So, maybe it's a suit of armor that has some protection from good and evil. Uh, am I misremembering the evil and good? I'm, I'm miswording that. There we go. Um, has some benefits. Uh, to that there. So, but it's only, but for this armor, because it's cold iron, it only, Fey is the only valid creature type up against it. Now, giving every Fey, every Fey creature disadvantage on an attack roll against one entity might be a little beefy. Um, we don't want... We want something here that might help the party in their ultimate encounter with the hags, because in all likelihood, they're going to fight them. Well, let's be honest. In all likelihood, they're not going to throw up their hands and go, well, well, you know what? This deals between the town and the hags. Not our problem, although they could. Um, in all likelihood, they're going to try to do something about it. And so giving them something that helps, helps prepare them for that encounter is good. We don't want something that wipes out the challenge of that encounter. So maybe this is something with, maybe it's something with charges. Maybe it lets them cast something like this. So let's take a look again. Let's go back to our Dungeon Master's Guide, which I don't have open. And let's get some guidance. Um, and let's go to creating a magic item. Oh, no, I didn't do it in the new tab. How dare I? Okay. Um, you know, if you go to this uh, Dungeon Master's Workshop section, the Dungeon Master's Guide section, Chapter 9, um, it's got some really great advice in here. A lot of it talks about, hey, you know, you don't always have to create something brand spanking new. You can modify or reskin something that already exists, and that really takes a lot of the work out of it. And frankly... I recommend doing that in a lot of cases um, because you know 
while yes, it's fun to kind of build your own stuff, doing it all the time is a lot of work and it adds a lot of variability into your adventure and running the risk of destabilizing an otherwise balanced campaign. Um, but making your own stuff is fun and your players really enjoy having unique things. Um, so I will frequently come back here and modify things to suit my adventure. Um, for example, you know, you might have noticed in our, uh, in our notes over here when we talk about um, the ghouls, we gave them immunity to disease, which I don't think ghouls normally have. Um, yep, they don't have immunity to disease, but we gave it to them here because it doesn't change their challenge rating, but it does mean they can move through these patches of disease that are here. Um, and so sometimes that's enough. Um, but really here we are creating a new magic item because we're taking a, a, a kind of armor and we're adding, hmm, yeah, we're adding our, our protection to it here. So, yeah, and this sort of makes it kind of a common here. If the max spell is our first level, we'll talk about coming up with your kind of power levels here. Um, yeah, do, 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 do. next spell level, the color, highest of the day, uh, in the form of a once per day or similarly limited property. For example, common magic item might confer first level spell once per day, which is once a consumable rare. Okay, so what's the duration on, it's 10 minutes, okay good for a fight. Good, good. Okay. Being able to cast this once per day would make this a common item. Hmm, maximum bonus. We don't need to address that. All right, so, you know, maybe, maybe they can cast it, maybe they get three per day, you know? We could go there, make it uncommon, give it, give them three casts of uh, protection from uh, evil and good per day. Um, yeah, and then it, but it only works against Fey since it's cold, since it's this uh, cold iron uh, infused. Yeah, this could work. Although that limits. Hmm. So maybe we don't nerf the spell at all. Maybe we just say that it that it allows this this casting, because then it's a piece of equipment they might use more often, and it doesn't one. So by limiting it here, by saying that hey, here's a suit of armor, which is kind of a beefy piece of equipment, something that they're going to wear for a while, um, and use a lot, and we say hey, you know, it gets you benefits, but it's only against Fey. Well, then that means that this armor is just armor. Um, against pretty much everything else. And so if you don't throw a lot of Fey into your campaign, well, then this armor feels not very special eventually. Um, but, you know, uh, but it also means that if you want to make an armor that's limited to Fey special, you've got to really lean into the Fey on your campaign, which maybe works for your campaign. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it feels limiting. So for this, why don't we just say that it gives protection from evil and good? It gets and allows them to cast that spell up to three times a day. That that seems reasonable to me. Um, one word for you uh, when you're doing this kind of stuff, um, when you're making new new things uh, for uh, uh, for your players, uh, whether those are uh, magic items or, you know, class features or what have you. Um, I always tell my players that I have, you know, I've created this thing, you know, these are the rules that we're gonna operate under it, but I reserve the right to adjust them as we need to, to balance it. And that works both ways. If we're finding that it's underpowered, like so for example, if we did limit this to Fey to start, and we get out of this adventure and realize we really haven't encountered any Fey in a while, you know, I might make the adjustment, okay, it, it works just like the regular spell. Or alternatively, if it's just the regular protection from evil and good and they've been running it for a while and now 
they're able to, you know, put disadvantage, you know, on on everybody they fight for the most part. Well, then maybe it gets limited. Maybe I, I, I mill away the kind of creatures that can affect. But by, you know, just giving your players a heads up that, hey, this is a, this is a new thing that I've created, and I think it's pretty balanced, but I reserve the right to make adjustments as needed. You know, it, it just reminds them that, uh, that you really want to work with them. You want to make sure they have the best experience possible. Um, and I've never, I've done that a few times, and I have never once had a player complain about me making a reasonable adjustment, even when I'm nerfing it a little bit. You know, most of the time you bring it up and they go, ah, yeah, I guess you're right. That's, that is a little, little OP, you know, because they want that challenge as well. All right, so let's let's make this real quick. Well, we still have a little bit of time, uh, so we're gonna say uh, cold iron armor, and we may come up with a cooler name for it later. But this is armor, all right. Um, and item templates. Think, 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 think. Um, we're going to say this suit of armor or is constructed with uh, cold iron, uh, giving it a chill uh, cold iron. Let's say that it feels cool. To the touch. All right. Um, okay, and we can always expand that out when we're get a better idea for what this is. Uh, and we'll say um, this armor confers all the benefits of its base armor type. Um, It also allows the wearer to cast protection from evil and good up to three. Uh, we'll just say parentheses three per day. Okay. Um, charges are regained. Well, I don't really need to say charges are regained. Don't if I do three per day. Again, this is just for us. So we can put whatever notation I want in here. I will attach the spell here. And, and I think that's bad boy there. Cool. So. We can come back to our glacial mine, and we can come to our forge, uh, and we can add to the treasure list. Um, and say cold iron armor. Uh, we'll say player choice of type uh, must be. Metallic. Cool. So for things like armor, I really do like to give players a choice. Um, because, you know, I mean, it, a, a paladin is likely going to wear different armor from your ranger. He's going to wear different armor from your cleric and so on. So letting them choose what kind of armor it is. Um, allows them to still get the enjoyment of getting a magical item without having to, um, you know, nerf any of their character benefits, right? Like, so for example, um, you know, your ranger isn't going to want scale mail if they're stealth based, right? And so, but they might want studded leather, which again is a metallic, has metallic elements to it here. So uh, giving them that choice uh, allows them to get a piece that they really want without having to make any concessions, um, well, any unnecessary concessions. Um, cool. All right. So uh, let's see here. So we can finish writing this now. So characters release her from the material. Ooh, 
the material plane uh, by helping to finish her masterpiece, A Suit of Cold Iron Armor. All right. Um, and so you're finishing the armor requires hmm, what should it take? Skill checks seem the most obvious to me. Um, and skill challenges can be fun when done sparingly. Um, a skill challenge effectively being that you know you you pick a skill or several different skills and the characters have to get so many successes before they get so many failures. Um, that can be fun um, if you're gonna narrate it well, right? Um, you, uh, um, what you don't want to do on something like that is to say, okay, you know, uh, you're gonna roll a, you know, you're gonna roll a strength check uh, with your proficiency in smithing tools, and then you're gonna roll a uh, intelligence check and then a dex check. And you just roll them back to back, and it's three rolls, and you go, oh, success, ooh, failure, oh, success. Uh, and, and don't give any more information on that. Um, also, requiring a skill challenge here um, that uses tools of the forge, um, Smith's tool or Tinker's tools or something along those lines, that can be fun with something like this because it can reward characters who have those tool proficiencies, which in many adventures are somewhat underused. Um, they, don't, they don't come up very as often as you might think in a lot of games. Um, and so they feel kind of pointless to some players. But this doing something like that could really reward somebody on that in this, um, giving them a benefit uh, when otherwise they, uh, they won't get the benefit of their proficiency with that. So you could do something along those lines. I also kind of like the idea of allowing the ghost to possess you. <laughs> um, like this is the ghost of a, of a forge master, a master smith, right? Um, so maybe, maybe the smith needs physical form for some of this. So maybe one or more of these checks is isn't so much about you, um, you know, accomplishing anything, or, or about your character accomplishing anything in particular. Maybe it's about letting the ghost act through you, which kind of gives like ghost like the Patrick Swayze. Is it Swayze? It's Swayze, right? Yeah, it's Swayze and Demi Moore, right? Uh, it kind of gives those vibes, um, which again can be fun and tropey, and depending on your group, um, could have a lot of fun jokes that go along with that. Um, but that could be kind of cool here. So, um, so let's. We're kind of we're getting low on our time here, so let's make a couple notes and we'll kind of wrap up um, to don't lose this idea. We can chew on this for a week. Um, how bad do we want a ghost moment with the ghost? Um, if you have thoughts on that, please let me know in the comments on this before next week, and we will address it. Um, okay, so requires a skill challenge with tool proficiency. Sees question mark and possibly may involve possession by the ghost herself. Ghost moment that could be fun. So little things like that I love to put into adventures. Even if my players never pick up on it, I will frequently make little jokes to myself in here just because you need to have fun with this too. Um, if you read through any of the published adventures from Wizards of the Coast, you will find that there are little gems in there that the players will never find. They're just in there for the DMs. Things like... Um, in the catacombs and Curse of Strahd, um, all of the goofy names of, uh, that are on all of the little tombs down there, um, the players are, are not going to find them all. 
They're not. They're just not going to spend time going through all, what, 40, 60 of them or something along those lines, um, coming up, you know, reading each of the names. Those things are in there for the DM. They're for, to make you smile, and you need those things. And I highly encourage that when you find those little moments of joy when you're writing these, just drop it in for yourself. Just, just if it, so, that it, so that when you come back and you play that moment, you remember that it just makes you giggle just a little bit. Um, sometimes you're rewarded by a, by a player catching out on the joke, um, and it feels really good. And other times it's just a happy little moment that's just for you during your session. Cool. Well, anyway, that brings us to the end of our time. Thank you so much again for joining me today um, on part five of Let's Write Adventure. Uh, we're going to continue our series next week with part six, uh, and I will put that, um, uh, I will put the notification for that up uh, on YouTube here uh, in a few moments. Um, if you've been enjoying the series, please like and subscribe to the channel. Hit that uh, bell icon so you never miss a video. I put out shorts, short videos. Uh, five times a week at this point, uh, in addition to these lives. Um, and I want to do more, more videos, uh, both shorts and then uh, more longer format. I say longer, we're talking, you know, five, 10 minute kind of videos. So if there's anything in particular that you have questions about that you want uh, me to address in any of these, these forums, please let me know. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts and, uh, and give you mine. Um, so again, yeah, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have a moment, check out my uh, my adventure published on the DMs Guild. That's Plague Breakers. It's a first level adventure uh, for uh, four characters, and it's a great way to get your get your campaign started. Um, so if you want to check that out, the link is in my links here. And uh, otherwise, I will see you next time.